Shohana. Ski pants. Ski pants. An oh-so-Canadian ritual, tiresome to most, but amusing for Ahmed Karsa and his son Ali. And this, a mundane chore, thrilling. <laughs> As they revel in their large backyard, their freedom and their family. Still, they experience flashbacks to being trapped on an island, treated as prisoners in one of Australia's controversial detention camps, even yearning to die. Well, the first time I'm seeing my father weak in there, in the in detention, I saw him weak, like five years of struggling and leaving our family behind. It's not an easy option, you know. I feel like everything happened to us like a miracle, let's say. It, it didn't happen like what we thought or what we planned. Not even close. In 2012, their home in Aleppo, Syria was destroyed, their lives most certainly in danger. So on the advice of others, the family of seven flew to Malaysia, only to discover it was expensive and Ahmed couldn't get a work permit. Desperate, Ahmed decided on the ultimate gamble. He would pay human smugglers their life savings to go by boat to Australia. He would take his son Ali, then 14. He would leave his wife Doha behind with a newborn and four other children. It was to save the family, he says. I say no, I don't want you to do that, but they said we have no option. We have to, some of us has, uh, has to sacrifice because otherwise we're gonna die here. He cannot work, find a job, he couldn't work. And we thought that once we arrive to Australia, we can sponsor them and maybe it'll, life will get easier. But as we saw that, it, it got much more harder. At that time, hundreds of asylum seekers were drowning at sea on their way to Australia. So the Australian government paid two small, impoverished countries hundreds of millions of dollars to house detention centers on their islands. Anyone who arrived by boat would be sent there with no chance of ever settling in Australia. Daniel Webb is a human rights lawyer who has visited the camps. They're warehoused indefinitely in conditions that the United Nations have said are inhumane and breach international law. So our policies are tremendously cruel Deliberately so. They're designed to treat anyone who arrives in a way that frightens off others who are thinking of coming. Journalists have never been granted access to the detention camps, but human rights organizations and the United Nations have documented abuse and squalor. The place was shockingly overcrowded. I remember one dorm that had 120 bunk beds crammed in so close together that you couldn't walk between them. Uh, there were security guards everywhere. I got shocked. Uh, like the first thing I said, returned me back to my country, Syria. I don't want to stay here. I want to die back in my country. The conditions so bad, even children have committed suicide. Australia treats refugees like animals, he says. Ahmed became depressed. Medical staff gave him drugs that made him sleep all the time. After two years, the father and son were allowed out of detention, but not off the island of Nauru. Ahmed and Ali were miserable and feeling hopeless. But unbeknownst to them, they had achieved their goal in a way they could never have anticipated. Doha was scraping by in Malaysia, working as a translator for the United Nations. But abandoned by her husband, her refugee application was moved to the top of the pile and forwarded to Canada. As a mother with five children in Malaysia, in that horrible circumstance, it got priority. priority. And they knew like about my husband and my son in that place. In November 2014, she arrived in Saskatoon and she held the golden ticket. The Canadian government agreed to help reunite the family. It took a year of legal wrangling, but three months ago, this was the extraordinary scene at the airport on the island of Nauru. We're happy for him. Wish him all the best. A 
other Syrian refugees and local aid workers celebrated as Ali and Ahmed became the first refugees to leave the Australian detention system for a Western nation. This was a fairly unique set of circumstances, not one that's going to provide a solution for the 2,000 people that the Australian government continues to leave languishing. All of them were trying their best to get me here. And I say the truth, I'm, the, I'm, I'm one of the luckiest people to get here. They couldn't believe they are coming. Like, am I dreaming or it's true? Ali has quickly adapted to life in Canada. He's enrolled in high school. It's too cold. He has dreams to become a human rights lawyer. I hope them to continue their education to be stronger in life. For me, I don't know. I have nothing for me. All of everything for them. I don't know. I, for me, I, I hope to have them always around me, not to lose anyone again. It's been more difficult for Ahmed. He's getting to know his youngest son, just a newborn, when Ahmed left, now three years old. Even amongst the snow and wonder of a new life in Canada, the scars linger. But he fights back his bitterness and focuses on reasons to smile. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Saskatoon.